Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. I hope you've all been doing well and staying safe. The world does feel kind of a crazy place right now, doesn't it? And I am talking to you here in the UK, but as the US election gathers pace, I find myself watching curiously from the outside, on the other side of the Atlantic, and wonder what role technology will play in determining the next president of the United States. And when I was doing a bit of research, I came across a company called Security Scorecard, who recently conducted a report into the cybersecurity posture of each Democratic candidate. And Joe Biden, the Democratic nominee, scored the highest. But with every war room and voter now coming out of quarantine, the future security of the next election almost feels like nothing like we've ever seen before. So with all that in mind, and me being curious as always, I invited them on the podcast today to discuss the election security and what risks are actually associated with the mobile election and much more. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to Cape Cod, where the CEO of Security Scorecard is waiting to speak with us now. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Sure. Well, Neil, thank you for having me on a podcast. Uh, My name is Alexander Impolsky, and I'm a founder and CEO of uh, Security Scorecard. And um, what we came up with is we came up with a way to give a security rating to any company in the world, uh, A, B, C, D, F, that represents cyber resilience of that company, how likely it is that the company is going to succumb to being hacked. I started the company out of my own experiences of working in companies like Oracle, Goldman Sachs, being a CISO. uh, And um, I saw that there's a huge problem in the market that as the market is moving into the cloud, we become all interconnected to each other. And as we all become interconnected to each other, we have absolutely no idea about how diligent are other companies that we do business with in terms of security. And so that was a little bit of a aha moment back in 2013, where we said, why can't there be a way to measure a security score for any company in the world? And uh, that's how Security Scorecard was born. It's a great story, and I love what you guys are doing here. And Security Scorecard is a global leader in cybersecurity ratings, and the only service that I'm aware of with over 1 million companies continuously rated. But for anyone hearing about Security Scorecard for the very first time, can you just tell the listeners a little bit more about what that means and what it is that makes you guys unique? Sure, of course. So what we do is um, – we had an idea that just like you could drive in a neighborhood in your car and, you know, by driving in a car, you look outside the window and you might notice broken windows, graffiti on a wall, and you can make certain type of deductions about what's going on in that neighborhood. Uh, we figured out that there's got to be a way to do the same for cybersecurity. For example, you could look at a website of a restaurant where you are thinking of going for dinner and you're going to notice that On the front page of a restaurant, it says copyright 2008. And obviously, it's 2020. It's not 2008. So that's not a vulnerability, but it's a signal telling you that they might not be very diligent about their cybersecurity. And so we figured out how to collect hundreds of signals from all over the world. We collect billions of different type of signals every single week on uh, data sets ranging from malware endpoint security, patching misconfigurations, leaked credentials. And then by sitting on six years of historical data, we give companies uh, scores that represent how likely the company is uh, to suffer a data breach. And we have over 1,200 customers who use our technology to rate their suppliers, partners. We have companies using our scores to report to their boards of directors about how they compare to the peer industry. We have Insurance companies like Liberty Mutual, Great American, OxXL, and many others using our scores to make insurance underwriting decisions on cyber. So um, our mission is to make the world a safer place. We envision a world where millions of companies worldwide 
are going to become safer by using our scores and improving their scores. And that's really what we're, uh, that's what we're trying to do. And over here in the UK, I've heard all about President Trump talking about remote voting and the dangers around it. And as a curious observer, with every US voter now under quarantine or actually starting to come out of quarantine now, can you tell me a little bit more about your recent report on the future security of the US election and why you think it's going to be unlike any election before it? Sure, of course. Well, I mean, I, I, I do think it's going to be a very interesting election to watch because there'll be a lot more people uh, participating. Uh, it's, it's a very heated, very charged election. You know, there's a lot of people passionate about uh, all kinds of topics about the direction that U.S. is going. So you're going to see a lot more people participating. You're also going to see a lot more adversaries trying to influence the election, a lot of hackers trying to find ways to use the hype around election to go compromise and infect people's computers. So just because of how many eyeballs, just because of how many people are going to be participating in it, I think it's going to attract a lot of positive and a lot of negative attention. And, uh, uh, you know, we do, a lot of, uh, we do a lot of research at Security Scorecard. And as a matter of fact, one report that we recently published was around uh, cybersecurity elections of and also what does a cybersecurity posture look like for different candidates and different different democratic candidates participating in this type of election and we found a lot of interesting stuff and on that interesting stuff that you found uh, i'm curious what did the report reveal about the cybersecurity posture of each candidate it, 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 did it reveal anything surprising there we found a, a bunch of very interesting information. So Security Scorecard found that the Democratic can, candidates' cybersecurity posture overall was positive. When we looked at the campaigns of all the candidates, they were graded at a rating of B or above. If you compare it to a year ago, in 2019, the DNC um, had an overall C grade. And what we've seen is we've seen a turnaround which demonstrated an increased focus on cybersecurity measures and candidates' willingness to invest in good cybersecurity hygiene. So overall, things got better. At the same time, each campaign utilized third parties for various critical functions. And, uh, you know, for example, some campaigns would go sell campaign merchandise using third-party stores. Some campaigns would use different type of hosting providers to host the websites. Other campaigns would use different type of donation type of mechanisms to collect the money uh, from uh, people who want to support. And despite the overall positive cyber posture for these campaigns, we still discovered a number of problematic findings with non-sanctioned websites and applications. So to give you an example, um, Security Squarecut discovered a cross-site scripting attack among a third-party community event management application uh, supporting Andrew Yang, one of the candidates who has seen dropped out of the race. So somebody could have used that vulnerability to go steal credentials from the community event organizers. And uh, um, what's interesting also is Biden, who is Joe Biden, who is currently the front runner, he actually scored the highest amongst all the candidates on cybersecurity. His, com his campaign uh, infrastructure was rated 97 out of 100 or uh, an A letter grade. And again, that showed that they took it seriously, they hired professionals, they thought ahead, and they made sure that um, the campaign was, uh, was uh, selected. And we are all living in a mobile world now, and the world feels very different to the way it did five years ago. So on the subject of election security, what do you think the risks are, especially when associated with a mobile election? Of course. Well, uh, I think that especially when we look at elections, um, elections have a couple of interesting complicating factors. Uh, number one, they're anonymous, and number two, they're irreversible. So, you know, once somebody votes, they should not be able to change the vote. And, and you know, number two, they should be kind of, you know, they should try to preserve their privacy. So I think that there's a lot of uh, different challenges Number one, could the hackers take down the system? Is the system going to be available at a crucial time? 
you know, is the system going to be available? Is it going to stay up? Number two, how do we ensure that the person who voted was actually who he or she was supposed to be? How do we, pre- how do we ensure end-to-end auditability in a remote voting scenario? Finally, we've seen hackers try to influence public opinion. So, you know, when people know that people are voting online, hackers will try to create fashion lookalike websites and try to lure people to go click on this website. So I think that even though there's a lot of challenges associated with uh, online elections, and I know that if you go talk to a lot of different security experts, they're not super positive on the possibility of a secure election security, while I recognize that there's a lot of work to be done. I'm actually very optimistic. I think that inevitably most things in today's world will be digitized and so will elections and so will doctor healthcare and many other things. And the current crisis that we live in only will accelerate that digitization. And so overall, by and large, while I do think that there's certain type of kinks remaining to be worked out, I'm optimistic that long term there should be plenty of ways to securely do online voting and, and that it would and that it will enable a lot of people who had little cho- chances to vote before now these people will have a chance and uh, you know I actually see it as a very positive thing. And I'm curious do you have any examples of how hackers could take advantage of virtual and mobile voting is there anything that stands out? Uh of course well uh for example uh if you're going to do and online voting, um, I mean, a very simple example would be um, there should be some type of a website or there should be some type of a URL where people go and uh, and submit their information. So one thing that hackers could go try to do is they could go try to set up a lookalike website. It could, it could look like a clone lookalike website. And then um, it looks very similar and then do some type of a, like a phishing campaign or mass email campaign to people and say, hey, here's a new site, go vote here. So it's going to be a combination of deception tactics where they clone it, where they uh, create a lookalike website, and they also time it properly so that uh, the site is distributed to people at the right time. We've seen the same type of stuff happen with COVID. For example, uh, a lot of people were looking for information about the spread of a COVID virus, and hackers exploited it. They created lookalike websites similar to website of the World Health Organization, and they use those type of websites to trick people to go in and there. And in your opinion, are there any critical steps that they should take, that political campaigns should take to improve and heighten their security? Yeah, so there's a number of good steps that political campaigns can take to improve their cybersecurity. So number one, um, they need to make sure that they train the staffers, the people who help orchestrate these campaigns on information security awareness training. The weakest link is always human. They need to train the people on information security awareness. They need to enable two-factor authentication everywhere. Uh, The second part is they should find out how they look to hackers from outside. How 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 do they simulate what a hacker would do to discover information about the political campaign? That's why getting a security rating for the campaign and also third parties that they use for the campaign is very crucial. And then finally, a lot of companies and a lot of campaigns focus on robustness instead of resilience. They try to make it as hard for hackers to get into their campaign, that's robustness, but instead they should change the mindset and focus on resilience. They should assume that hackers are always going to be able to get into their system and then they need to make the system as hard as possible to exfiltrate the sensitive information out of it. We've seen we've seen Macron election campaign in France do this. They assumed that the hackers would target them and they made it very difficult for hackers to find out which documents were legitimate and which ones were decoys and it worked very well for them. So it would be great to see other campaigns adopt this resilience first uh, mindset as well. Of course, there is a lot of nervousness at the moment as we come out of this lockdown period and this global pandemic. But uh, what impact do you think it will have on election security as a whole? I actually think it will have a positive impact. I think that um, 
I think that even though there's going to be more people trying to influence through social media manipulation elections, there'll be more efficient websites, uh, it will also result in security experts focusing more on how to mitigate this campaign. So it will make it harder for that. It will continue to be a cat and mouse game. And I think that as we come out out of the current pandemic, I actually think it will have a positive impact because people will realize that online elections are inevitable. And so they're going to have to iron out the kinks that exist in a security and get them better. And I've got to ask, what excites you about the role of technology in the next election? Because it sounds like it's a, uh, something that you're following very closely and you enjoy following and, and the technology aspects. But what is it that excites you about it? So I'm a big believer in technology being a catalyst for social change and just things getting better. As we emerge from this crisis, there's going to be many new amazing companies, innovations created on better virtual collaboration, online elections, cybersecurity, telemedicine. I think that we're going to see more ways for people in remote places to instantly vote online through mobile devices in the future. It's going to promote democracy. It's going to result in better ways to have more secure technology to enable this type of things which weren't possible before. So I'm very excited about what's to come. Transformations in a society always happen through cataclysmic shifts like the one we experience in. So I think that um, the current crisis will accelerate a lot of the techno- technological innovation to come. Excellent. Well, we've covered a lot of ground today. So for anyone interested in checking out the report that we talked about, finding you guys online and seeing, reading more about the kind of work that you're doing, or even contact your team and continue the conversation we started today, what's the best way of doing that? Uh, sure. So you can check us out on our website, uh, securityscorecard.com. Or you could find myself on Twitter at A Yampolsky, A Y A M P O L S K A Y. Uh, so it's either a website or on Twitter. Excellent. Well, I'll add all those links to the blog post that will accompany this episode. So many great talking points here about the election, and things are just starting to get going there. And I think there's going to be more and more watchful eyes on it, especially the role that technology will play in that. But more than anything, just a big thank you for taking the time to come on and talk about not only a report, but the great work that you're doing with Security Scorecard too. So thanks again. Thank you for having me, Neil. Now, I will never talk about politics or religion on this podcast because it's a topic that I always steer clear of. But I really enjoyed chatting today as a neutral about the way hackers can take advantage of a virtual and mobile methods of voting and the critical steps that political campaigns should take to heighten their security and also the impact that the coronavirus might have on the election security as a whole. So I will add all those links to the, so I will add links to the report in the show notes but please Let me know your thoughts. You can email me techblogwriter at outlook.com. My website is techblogwriter.co.uk. So if you've got any comments about today's interview, if you've got a question about anything or you'd like to come on this podcast, whatever it might be, send me a quick email now. If not, don't worry. I'm still going to be here tomorrow. We'll have another guest ready and waiting for you. So don't be late. But before I go, just a big warm thank you for me for listening to the show. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.